of the board members, and I was also on the program committee. Um, in addition to thanking our corporate sponsors today, who I hope you'll patronize, uh, we'd like to thank the, the people here at Cafe Lina for providing this space. Without their support, this festival would not have been possible. For those of you who have not already picked up books or visited Northshire Books, uh, are, please be aware that you know our um, the recent titles of all of our authors appearing throughout the festival will be on sale there. We also have a pop-up bookstore in the library as well, and one of our authors today is self-published, so he has uh, information where you can publish uh, his books as well, so you can speak to him after the session and get that information from him as well. Um, we also have some book plates available, so if you weren't able to get a book ahead of this session but you'd like to uh, get it signed, we have those available, um, and so just let us know. And or if you've gone to the book pop us up and there's nothing, you, we're all sold out. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't been there yet. Um, then you can grab a book plate. Um, also, I know we're just beginning, but mark your calendars for our second annual Hope Book Festival, uh, which is scheduled for October 22nd, 2022. So it's nice. 10, 22, 22. Um, hope to see you there next year as well with a friend or more friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> So with all that business out of the way, please help me welcome and thank our authors whose time and generosity during these uncertain times would not, um, con con I'm sorry, contribute the most to making this festival a great success. Um, so with us today here are three writers capable of creating new and fantastical worlds with their works. Uh, Keith Willis graduated long ago with a degree in English literature from Barry College, which has the distinction of being the world's largest college campus. He now lives in the scenic Hudson Valley, Adirondack region of New York with his wife, Patty. Keith is certain those rumbling noises attributed to Henry Hudson's crew are really just the dragons grumbling. <laughs> Keith and Patty have one grown son, Matt, who actually thinks it's pretty cool that dad wrote a book. <laughs> Um, Keith's interests include reading fantasy, sci-fi, and classic mysteries, camping and canoeing, and cutthroat games of Scrabble. <laughs> he began writing, writing seriously in 2008 when the voices in his head got too annoying to ignore. When he's not making up stories, he manages a group of database content editors at a global information technology firm. Trader Knight is his first published novel and has won awards for both fantasy and romance. The Knights of Kilborn series continue with Desperate Night and Enchanted Night. Book four, tentatively titled Stolen Night, is currently in the drafting stage with a projected release date of 2022. Hannah Porter is novelist, playwright, teach, sorry, novelist, play, playwright, teacher, McDowell Fellow, and co-founder of the Octavia Project, a STEM and fiction writing program for girls trans and non gender non-conforming youth from underserved communities. She lives in Los Angeles, California, and is currently at work on her next novel. Um, sorry, on her next novel. Robert Rapino is the author of several works of fiction, including the science fiction novel, More, from Soho Press, and the middle grade novel, Spark and the League of Ursus, from Quirk Books. He is an editor of Religious Studies and History for Oxford University Press and teaches for Gotham Writers Workshop. So please welcome them. And uh, as a reminder, please silence your phones. Thank you. Thank you. So I am, uh, I guess, taking the lead, but I'm not exactly a moderator. So my, my colleagues here have the right to steamroll me whenever they feel it necessary. <laughs> uh, just the way this sort of came together, um, I knew someone who was organizing this we had originally talked about maybe making it just a dystopian one. Then we, as we started gathering more people and, and seeing just the wide diversity of thought when it comes to this stuff, um, it just we ended up kind of jamming a bunch of things together. So we have world building, we have science fiction fantasy, we have uh, some dystopia stuff. We're all over the place. So it just just shows you the, the you know the endless possibility with this. And one slight correction, I hope you don't mind me saying this. Your book, I don't think it's self-published. No, it's, it's not. Published with, it is published with a, with a publisher. So I just want to, this is a very important thing, so I just want to make sure we, we square that. Okay, so uh, I wanted to start with a, um, a question that hopefully will give you some tips, but also help 
everybody here to go into some detail about their, their own work. Um, just this issue of world building. I feel like this term didn't really become popular until just a few years ago. I don't know what they called it before that. Um, but um, I just want to ask everyone here, I'm going to start with Keith. How do you define world building? What do you think it is? And can you give us any specific examples on how you built the world in your books? And of course, without, without summarizing the whole book. Uh, right. Well, <laughs> that's a challenge, though. As Which nobody can do anyway. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so in terms of world building, I think it's really answering a lot of questions. You know, first of all, you know, fantasy and science fiction and dystopian authors, we get a little more scope than the, the mystery authors and the romance folks. You know, they, you know, they have to set their story in, you know, small town Maine or 1940s Chicago or whatever. There's not an awful lot they can do with it. You know, we get a little more play. You know, we can say, yeah, we're gonna set, I'm gonna set my book in small town Maine, but it's gonna have zombies. <laughs> you know, you get a little more things to play with there. You know, 1940 Chicago, but there's a time traveler. You know, so you've got to answer some questions, I think. You know, where in the world is your world? You know, is it part of this world? Is it an alternate world? Which is what mine is. Mine's kind of an a an amalgam of, say, Scotland and Wales, but it's really has nothing to do with our, our current Earth. Um, you know, does magic work? You know, what kind of creatures do you have? Are there, is there technology available? You know, and how does all that work? Different systems of government, things like that. So there's a lot of questions you have to answer, and I don't know, you know, how these guys do it. I just kind of wing it as I go and, and really kind of figure it out as I'm writing the story. I, I never have an outline for anything, so I'm just figuring things out and listening to my characters as, as they tell me the story. Oh, okay. I like that a lot, and I want to build on what you said about the questions, because I feel like when I write something, the answering of questions is something that I um, it's like I need to continue to come back to my own curiosity. Uh, and why I think I started to write in a speculative way was because I see our reality now not as something that is set, but as something that is malleable um, and that these are agree agreements that we've made collectively, historically, individually. Um, so, like with my book, The Seep, um, I wanted to think about how something very big, which is a, it's a disembodied um, kind of hive mind um, alien consciousness coming to our planet and then remaking reality. I wanted to like use the frame of that to point to like, these are things that we've agreed to and the hive mind, which is us now, we can change those param parameters. Um, so I think that's a really exciting thing about, um, you know, why I started this uh, summer program for teenagers too. It's taking the power back in terms of these are not natural ways that we live. They're not set in stone. They're choices that we've agreed to, um, and we can we can make changes to that as well. I just came from a wonderful panel at the Saratoga Library, Library, Ray, um, and that's always the thing that I point to. The idea of like we assume that a public library is something that we've had in our society for a long time, and it's not. It's a new thing, relatively speaking, that we've agreed to, that books should be in a public space and anyone should be able to go and get them. Um, so things that are so small that we assume are natural or the way that people do it or the way that it's always been done, um, that's what I really like about when you get weird with speculative. <laughs> yeah, well, two deep answers, and now I'm about to tell you about my talking cat book with uh, machine guns. Well, this is good. Yeah, uh, right, so, I mean, I think of world building as 
both explaining how the world works, but also showing it uh, and giving it texture. So if you think of, um, you know, Star Wars, for example, we get the crawl at the beginning, just setting everything up, which, and it's, and it's short and sweet, isn't it? You can't have a character standing there explaining it for a while, but then we also just see how that world is lived in. Uh, the, the spaceship is, is not just this sleek thing that just, you know, gets you from point A to point B, it has real character to it. And you know, just the scene where Han Solo has to punch the computer to make it work, like that scene right there does a ton of world building without having Han Solo turn to the camera and be like, sometimes I have to punch the computer in order to make it work. You know, this is, this is the, the big challenge with world building is balancing the exposition with the, um, with, with like the actual action that can tell you so much more. Um, I, two resources I would recommend to anybody here who is, right, is trying to do more world building. One would be uh, Charlie Jane Anders, who's a science fiction writer. She has a, a resource called uh, Seven Deadly Sins of World Building. And they include things like not explaining why things are happening right now and not taking into account basic infrastructure, like what do people eat in this fantastical world that you've created? Um, you know, just things like that to, to consider. Um, there's also the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writer of America. They have a really good resource on, on world building that's like, it's one of those things where it has all these drop downs and, and the document just keeps getting bigger and bigger because it's all these things to consider, like how do they take out the trash? You know. Or as Charlie Jane Anders says, uh, what does it smell like in this place after it rains? Just mm. texture like that that you need to throw in there. Um, but yeah, I guess with, with me, you know, the world building I had to do, I did some research. I am a planner. I am an outliner. That's why I'm always in awe when someone's like, I just, you know, I just put it out there and, and it just goes to a place. I, I tried to plan it a little better, although in my case, the research was, you know, I, I did enough research on like ant behavior, animal behavior to say, okay, here's how it works in the real world, but I don't want it to work that way. I want it to work different. So I'm kind of just gonna hand wave some of the things away and hopefully my reader will just trust me and follow me and, and we'll go from there. Mm. Um, all right, so. I have a really quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Do you outline at the start or do you have some of a draft? I have, with each successive novel I've done, I've done um, I outline more and more. Uh, just because it makes it just makes it easier for me and my outline isn't that detailed It's just enough to say in this chapter This needs to happen in order for the next chapter to actually get started So if I have it enough of that down I can that works for me. So um, I have tried winging it before like I'm one of those people that tried to learn how to write By instead of by writing shorter pieces, which is the right way to go I tried to learn teach myself how to write by writing novels, which is not the best way to teach yourself um, I think a better thing is just write a short piece every couple of weeks and then do that for a year. Most of it will be bad, but some of it will be good and you will be better. But if you try to write a novel, I feel like that can be demoralizing. You get like 50,000 words in and you're, you're burnt. You might not, you know. Uh, anyway, that's my biased experience. Um, all right, I'm talking too much. Uh, I did wanna uh, go back to our group here and just say, just ask you, are there any examples of world building that you've seen in either movies or books that you said like, oh, that's how you do it. That's how you nail it. Like, I want to do something that original and that, that well done. And I, I guess I'll start with you this time, Connor. Hello. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a deep cut and then I'm gonna do something broader. So deep cut wise, um, there's a British filmmaker named Derek Jarman, who I really love, he's really important to me. Um, he, wrote a movie called Jubilee, which is like post-apocalyptic women biker gangs in Britain. So It's, I mean, Robert, you would love it. Um, but I just love how um, aesthetically, you know, this is not, um, this is a film that was like very low budget. Um, and coming from like a theater back, back, background too, be, before I wrote uh, novels, I, 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 I made plays um, and I still make plays. So the like materiality of we can't do um, an amazing spaceship, we can't do um, computer things, or um, I really like how that like uh, space was made through color and sound and through um, the things that he chose. So 
that was very, I just think that that's an inspired, 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 inspired thing to point towards is um, sometimes our can, constraints can make something like even more beautiful. So I'm gonna think about my more um, one that we would all know. Okay. <laughs> Why don't we go there? Yeah. Okay. That's true. Um, so first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Tolkien, just because. Why? Well, and people are gonna throw things at me here. Mm -hmm. I love Lord of the Rings, but Tolkien did so much world building in there, and I just want to say, get on with the darn story. <laughs> you know? I, yes. 50 pages about the elves and the history and everything is great, but tell me the story. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that sometimes trips people up a lot, is they, they fall into that of, oh, we gotta give all this deep background and everything. Um, my inspiration for world building, I think, in terms of, of really how to do it is Terry Pratchett, mm -hmm. who created Discworld, which is a, a flat world on the back of four elephants on the back of a giant turtle. Um, if you're not familiar with it, check it out. It's, it's marvelous. But he's built a world that you know, takes into account the gods, it takes into account regular people, and he tells the stories from so many different perspectives. You know, he's got like three or four different series within this world that all look at it from a, a different aspect. You know, one is from the aspect of the watch, one is from the aspect of the witches, uh, there's one where he, you know, one cycle where he, his main character is death. Duh, actually, uh, with a cap, all capitals. So, you know, I just, you know, and he does all this so seamlessly. I, I think, you know, one of the things that as writers we really, you know, should be doing, if we're not, is to, you know, not do a lot of info dumping, but to, you know, really work all this world building into the, into the story so that you know sometimes you even have you know it's part of well as you know Bob but you know to just to slide it in there so you don't really even know you're you're getting that information mm. yeah just we were, we were talking last night about uh, disguising info dumps so they don't look like info dumps right. so I I mean in my book I had uh, like there's a children's play that gives a lot of the story there's mm -hmm. like a um, there's a scene where someone uses a machine that alters their mind and it implants memories in them. So that was a way of getting some exposition in there without, again, having to, well, Bob. Well, Bob, as you know, things are much different ever since that plague turned us all into hamsters. <laughs> like, you wouldn't need to say that out loud if we were all hamsters. Uh, so <laughs> um, I guess, yeah, some good examples. I, because I, I work in the field of history and uh, for my day job, I really like it when somebody squeezes in a good primary source document. That's all, when you can do that well. Uh, Ursula Gwynn's uh, Left Hand of Darkness does that really well. Uh, she has like some legends in there. Um, an, an interesting example that I think is hard to mimic, but I, I, I've thought about it a lot, is at the end of A Handmaid's Tale is an academic paper about the history of Gilead, and it's like thousands of, I don't know if it's thousands of years later, but many years later. Um, and it's funny, because like that's a book that earns that moment. You know, um, might be harder to jam that in earlier because, as as you mentioned, like getting to that to the point where the, you know, the the elves actually or the the, the hobbits actually leave the Shire. It's like page one hundred and fifty of Lord of the Rings. It's killing me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think those are some good examples of world building. Now I have to move on to examples where you were, where I was just like, no, that didn't work. Um, and I, I guess I, I want to answer this first because I can't help it. Um, I <laughs> I saw. Um, there were two superhero movies that I, I really did enjoy, uh, that both did this. One was Aquaman mm -hmm. and one was Captain Marvel. I really liked them, but Captain Marvel has a scene where um, it's just stuffed with question marks. Um, it's uh, the, before she becomes Captain Marvel, she's asking Jude Law a bunch of questions about this world. And at one point, after he's answered like a dozen of them, he goes, you know this. And I was leaving the theater, and one of my students was there, and he came over, and he's like, he did the thing that you told us not to do. And I was like, that's right. Um, it happens in Aquaman as well, where a guy's like, let me tell you this whole story about your grandfather. I was like, you ha you're deciding to tell him this story now about his grandfather when like, you're about to get killed by Aquaman? I don't understand this. Anyway, um, mm. there's just some odd examples of, of like bad world building. Well-intentioned, but bad, yeah. I love that, and I wanna say, uh... A good way to do that, if you want to, is I think what you would call the fish out of water mm -hmm. thing, which is, um, you know, 
someone is a new person in this place or they've been um, Octavia Butler's Lilith, Lilith's Brood series, you know, starts with a human woman who wakes up on a spaceship. So we get a lot from that. We get a lot from her being in this like kind of cell, but the walls are alive and people serve her, um, you know, some sort of meal. And then she at some point is like, oh, I eat the bowl too. Like everything is, she's like, I'm in a living space and we're, we don't know and she doesn't know and we both learn it with each other, which I think is really nice. And then I think, I'm blanking on his name, but the wonderful movie, or at least I thought it was wonderful, Snow Piercer. Did you right. see that? Yes. That has some really good world building. It's about, um, there's been a huge climate crisis. Um, the world is now very, very cold, and there's a train, there's a looping train that goes around the planet, and all of humanity is on the train. So who's at the back of the train and who's in the front of the train? It's about capitalism, it's a metaphor. But, uh, you know, there's children's songs, children are being brought up on, on the train, they're like learning their own mythology. And there's uh, very nice ways that you can work that in, in a way that feels natural. Because we do, I don't know, I'm a step parent now and there's a lot of, um, ways that we communicate, I think, to young people is a really nice way of, um, you know, they're not going to, <laughs> they'll ask the question and then they'll not really wait for your response most of the time. I feel like uh, other parents will probably understand that, that, that but um, yeah, we're, we're world building culturally in our, our families all times too yeah, yeah. answering questions yeah yeah um, and uh, Keith did you want to talk uh, smack on anybody like I have on the Marvel <laughs> Universe or any any other bad examples of world building no I'll, I'll stick with my my knock it toll yeah that's that's a, that's a bold move so yeah <laughs> I, I can rename this panel <laughs> to the knock and Tolkien <laughs> <laughs> all right um, I did want to ask, I mean, since dystopia was on this list of topics we were going to talk about, um, I was curious if you had any big thoughts on it. I mean, to me, the, the, the issue with dystopia is that it has really dominated uh, a lot of science fiction and fantasy lately. Um, some people would even say something like Game of Thrones is dystopian because it, it's a world where um, the world is messed up because of the rules and the society they have. You know, So it, in a way, it's almost deliberately uh, screwing things up. But of course, there are questions of like, is it even, um, is it even needed anymore in the wacky age that we're living in? Uh, or another question you could consider is, you know, why do you think it's so popular? Obviously, there's many, maybe it's popular just because somebody figured they could make money that way. I don't know. Or maybe it's popular because it is speaking to some deeper fear or deeper trend in society. Um, yeah, so I guess, sorry, I'm open-ended question. I just want to say, um, yeah, why do you think it's been so popular? You think it's even necessary? Um, any general thoughts on it? Maybe you don't even need it anymore. I, I guess I'll start with you, Keith, and then we'll. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's dystopian fiction is popular just because it calls out, you know, things that we're afraid of or should be afraid of. Um, you know, you go back to the classic 1984. Um, you know, Orwell was basically writing about the dangers of Stalinism and Nazism at the time. Um, you know, in terms of what dystopian fiction is, to me, really, it's all about control and despair. It's, you know, there's a central authority who is trying to control, you know, essentially everything in that world. Um, you know, there's no individual freedom or autonomy. Um, I think part of the appeal to it is then seeing, you know, we, we try to identify with the rebels, you know, the people who are fighting again, because normally there's somebody fighting against that dystopia. Um, so I think that's kind of what makes it popular and, you know, 
I think the, the fantasy setting of most dystopian fictions is, you know, it makes it a little bit removed so it's not as uncomfortable. You know, if The Hunger Games was took place in Philadelphia, I don't know if it would have been as popular. You know, people would have just said, oh, that's kind of weird and I don't really like that idea. Yeah. Um, you know, setting it in, you know, some place that doesn't actually exist, I think makes a big difference in making that, you know, that more accessible to us. Anna, did you have a, a rant prepared? Oh, <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, I think um, I think there's like vali validity and truth and merit to all of these forms that we have to apply in. Um, I think in the case of my book, it's a fascinating sort of like Rorschach test because some people find it very dystopian and some people find it very utopian and some people think it's like a complicated utopia. Yeah. Um, you know, something that I don't remember uh, who said it, so I can't credit it, but this idea does not come from me, but it, I carry that one, which is, um, we have had many things in our country, in this world that are, that like have been to those people apocalyptical. So actually that's something that the writer N.K. Jemison talks about. Mm -hmm. Like whenever you're thinking about writing an apocalypse, like you need to think about like places where that has already been uh, and what it felt like for those communities. Not to write like through another person's point of view, but just to know that like, um, you know, sometimes it feels like dystopia and I think the Hunger G G G Games is a really good ex example. It's like you're thinking about inequalities and power stru structures that are right now still present, but with everyone, and that's what feels dystopic. It's mm -hmm. like when the white people are suffering, like that's how you get Star, Star Wars. Like that's um, uh, Samuel de Laney wrote um, a really amazing review of Star Wars in like 1973 from like a black point of view. Um, yeah, so everyone should go and read that right now. Um, yeah, but I, 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 I think that they're very valid storytelling. Um, it's always a, it's always like a delight and a surprise to me though when um, people view my book from like a dystopian point of view and I'm like, well, would I welcome an alien invasion? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to remind you this is being recorded. Uh, could be any worse, right? <laughs> right. Good point. Yes. I, I mean, one, it always could be. It could be. Yeah. It always. I for one welcome our Ann overlords. <laughs> um, wow, okay, yeah, th that's cool. Um, and now I've just forgotten what I was going to say about my dystopians. Oh, no, no, this is what I was gonna say. Um, uh, fun fact, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a dystopian or apocalyptic story. Um, he wrote some short fiction and it's called The Comet. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an interesting one. I've written a little bit about it for my day job for the OUP blog, but it, it's, um, uh, it's a story that examines the upheaval that would happen in an apocalypse. You know, the, the same situation where, yes, a comet coming destroying America would be bad, but if you're a person who's at the bottom and who's really been treated like a second class citizen, that sense of upheaval might be an opportunity for um, some kind of rising up. You know, one of my favorite characters in all of science fiction is Anti Entity, played by Tina Turner uh, in the movie. Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Mm. And she has that wonderful line where she asks Mad Max, what were you before this? And, uh, and she goes, I was nobody. But except on the day after, I was still alive. And this nobody had a chance to become somebody. 
And that is like a really important examination of how different groups would look at this. You know, so I think taking that into consideration is, is, is a big part of, of, uh, of these things. But you know, I think a lot of this dystopian stuff, I, I mean, I'm sure there's been a lot of ink spilled over how it's a reaction to 9-11 maybe or just other upheavals. But, but I think that is still speaking to what you guys have mentioned just about it's some stresses, but also, also in some cases not taking into consideration the full perspective of the human experience. Because obviously like some people are already like, I'm already dealing with an apocalypse. Like you guys are finally having some inconvenience and you're worried about apocalypse. Like I survived Hurricane Katrina. I survived the Iraq war. Like, you know. Um, all right, we are at the halfway mark. I was gonna ask my friends one more question. I have more questions after that, but I figured now might be the good time, after that question might be a good time to see if you have any. Uh, so the last one I was gonna ask was, uh, and you can take this however, whatever direction you wanna go. What are some tropes in science fiction and fantasy you don't need to see anymore? <laughs> or what, so what, are some, yeah, what are some tropes you don't need to see anymore, and what are some tropes you'd like to see a little bit more? Um, and uh, I don't know if anybody has a, wants to start. Uh, Why don't you start? <laughs> um, I have dedicated most of my career to fighting against uh, chosen one tropes. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, cho and look, and obviously there have been many uh, great examples of chosen one stories. I'm not going to deny that. Um, I think there have been too many, and I think it very often. Um, it robs the character of, of uh, being interesting in some cases. I, you know, you have a lot of stories where the chosen one is often a man, and he gets trained to be the real chosen. He gets trained to be the chosen one, maybe by a badass woman. You have this. This happens with Captain America. It happens with Aquaman and some other examples. It's like, why not just make her Captain America? <laughs> Which is, is, in fact, I think the subject of one of the episodes of that show. What if? Like, why not just make her Captain America? Give her the serum. She can do it. Um, so uh, yeah, chosen ones are kind of boring to me. I'd like to see fewer of those. I guess things I'd like to see more of, um, I mean, I, I'm interested in the way, I, like I do, I do religious studies in my day job, so I'm always interested in explorations of, of religion, how they're invented, how they die, how they influence people, both good and bad. I'd like to see more exploration of that, uh, especially in light of the last few years where we've seen, you know, we've seen Religious groups come together and do some good things. We've also seen some some wacky stuff, especially in relation to certain political movements and uh, the pandemic. I'll leave it at that. Um, so yeah, the, I guess those are the things that I'd like to see more of and less of. Um, anybody want to go? Yeah. Okay. I am looking for things that feel more complex. Um, less of the good versus e e evil. Um, I think that's like a really simple cop-out. Um, yeah, so more complex um, things that are about groups and groups really like struggling with each other there. Like um, I'm a big Jordan Peele fan. I lo loved us. Um, and of course, you know, I loved him get out but I thought about how sometimes we're limited by our own um, genre like what I wanted to see am I gonna spoil this movie for you all no has anyone not seen it can I talk about it eh, why not yeah, Is it okay? you get what you pay for okay okay <laughs> it came out a couple years ago so. um, you know it's a film about like everyone having a twin who's living underground, and then at some point the twins come up and try to kill the look-alike. So it's about like how our lives are supported by people far away uh, who are in like bad. It's like it's about all kinds of things, but there's like a labor frame that you could look at it through, which I think is cool. But I was fascinated by what if, I mean, what if there was some killing, but what if um, everyone came up and then they all had to be with each other? <laughs> like, uh, I'm fascinated by that. Like, uh, morally complicated, how do we all, how do we all make space in this place for each other there? Um, and that's something that I'd like to see more more of in a speculative 
genre. Yeah. So Robert kind of stole mine because I, <laughs> yeah, I'm very anti the chosen one as well. In fact, I, I play with that a little bit in my book. Um, my character, Lady Marissa, is everybody wants her to be the chosen one. You know, there's there's all these different prophecies about you know that everybody says is about her. Mm. And she's like, no, I don't want any part of this. <laughs> you know, and just go away, leave me alone. I just want right. to do my own thing. Um, you know, and the other thing, I, I write very lighthearted fantasy. So you know, I you know I tend to look at things from a little bit different perspective. You know, there's so much out there from the aspect of you know, there's the, you know, like Sauron, there's the evil overlord who wants to take over the world. Um, and I, I just like to see more, you know, character driven as opposed to quest, I guess, driven mm. uh, stories, you know, where, you know, we're, we're following characters, we're learning about their, you know, how they grow, how they interrelate with people, you know, how they share that space, yeah. as it were. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of, uh, world building in you know my book talking about how the different species and, and creatures are getting along or not getting along as the case may be and how that tends to play out so you know that's kind of where I come from yeah and just adding to what you both have said I, I think having a story in which you can look at it through the villain's perspective and now suddenly the villain is the protagonist, that to me is the ideal. Because mm -hmm. everybody yeah. thinks they're the hero even if they're doing something terrible. Right. It's, I think it's rare anymore to get away with just evil, like the Voldemort evil <laughs> thing. You know, and not, it's been done well before. Uh, Emperor Palpatine's fun. But um, yeah, I think, I think there has to be a little bit more, um, maybe empathy's the wrong word, but just understanding motivations, that's it. Well, everybody's the hero of their own story. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it just matters what perspective you're telling it from, I guess. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't know if I could really tell it from the perspective of the villain. Right. But I do, you know, in in my first book, I do kind of and even in the second one, I do kind of look at it from the villain's perspective a little bit. I mean, I give their point of view because I, I do multiple character points of view throughout the story. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you see things through the bad guy's eyes for a while, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so I do have more questions, but like I said, we have about 20 minutes left. So I was going to ask if you had questions, but before anyone raises their hand, I just want to say, um, please try to keep it to one question, and if it takes longer than 20 seconds to get it out, I want you to ask yourself, am I really asking a question right now, mm -hmm. or am I giving a sermon? Which I understand, but we're just a little pressed for time. Um, so, all right, I see a hand in the back. You look confident. I know you're going to get us off to a good start. I hope so. So when it comes to world building, what do you think about keeping some major component of how the world works a secret for almost the entire story, kind of forcing the reader to maybe figure it out or, or wait till the ending? I have something to say about that. That's a really good question. Um, Jeff Vandermeer talks about this in terms of you're not running around explaining how your cell phone operates to each other. So the things that structurally everyone takes for granted, I think, but are so woven through, that can be a really nice thing. Unless it's something that the main character is going to like discover. Oh, um, Ishiguro, who's a master, his new book, Clara and the Sun, I thought did a really nice job of, you know, it's from the point of view of a robot um, and politically, crazy things have occurred. You're hearing about people in compounds and um, education is very fraught and strange, but she, Clara, accepts everything because that's all she's ever known. Um, so it's really like up to the reader to kind of draw their own conclu conclusions. And he turns the knob up and down in terms of like, what is important or not. Yeah, and I would just say very quickly, uh, t helping to answer that question, you take into consideration the, the position, my position, which is that um, it's always better for the character to discover something as opposed to be told something. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that might help you choose more strategically. Like, is it a, are we at a place to the point where the character is taking action to discover something as opposed to sitting there and being told something? I think that might help pace things a little better. Um, I don't know, Keith, you have anything to say on this? 
No, I think you guys have covered it pretty well. All right, we'll get you uh, next time. I did see this hand next, and then I'll look, I'll look to my right eventually, but I did see this hand next. Hi, um, so I was just kind of gonna address um, LGBT people in fantasy, because I know this tends to be like the platform that LGBT char characters are most commonly written in. Mm. So I guess what are your thoughts about that as um, like fictional characters as opposed to incorporating into like historical based type, because um, a lot of times they wind up being like fantastical, like non-human um, species, and just kind of how do you think that's been handled, pros, cons, et cetera? <laughs> what would you like to see? <laughs> um, I can't say I have direct um, experience with this. I, I've written about, I mean, most of the characters I've written about are, are uh, animal characters. Um, though I have been told that some of the themes in the story, because it does involve characters um, kind of transitioning and choosing a new name for themselves, and this is a big deal. Um, so I think maybe accidentally my books have addressed this, and I've had some people tell me like, yeah, actually I related to that because, you know, because the, the, there is there are some themes in there that are, are relevant. Mm. Um, I mean. I, I think that there's something special about this genre and, and even accidentally special because you know you look at things like when they were when they wrote the script for Alien, somebody just randomly said, What if the captain's a woman? And they all just looked at each other and said, Yeah, let's make her a woman. Let's just do it. And it was like there was that level of open mindedness and, and obviously there's a lot of issues, there's a lot of debates and, and there are a lot of bad actors, unfortunately. You've probably heard of them. Um, I do think that that group is slowly I hope to think that they're 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 kind of getting put into their little compartment where they can just be trolls and 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 be you know because uh, you probably you can Google the, some of these folks that I'm talking about you know what I'm talking about all right I'll, I'm rambling now so maybe somebody I should talk. love this question um, you know I think it's no no surprise that Star Trek was like I mean so Star Trek is like the first interracial kiss in the 1960s. Uh, and similarly, me, like little baby queer in the suburbs, watching DS9, seeing Dax as like, Dax is a woman that has a genderless symbiont inside her that like lives through time, like it's passed from like host to host. And not, not Dax as, uh, so Dax's wife from like a previous body comes on to a DS9 and the fact that they're both in these like women bodies now is not even talked about and they're just like, do we start over? They're kissing each other. It's the 90s, I'm in my parents' basement. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. Mm -hmm. And here's this like future space with a black and cat and cat and captain and like these things are are just being shown and that's part of how they're like remaking our current reality so like i just think oh, it's so important it's so important to have these like spaces um and it's very exciting for me now uh that it feels so much more like overt and mainstream, but that there were spaces, you know, 20 years ago, more, where um, these, <laughs> these things were being shown in a completely normal way because they were not in Philadelphia. They were <laughs> on a space right. station. Yeah. So, I mean, me, like, reading Octavia Butler at 19, in a public library, Ray, I knew that she was telling me something about like found family and like queer family, and I didn't like I could go off and like read like people writing about real life after, but I needed I needed genre to like point me towards not something so concrete because there wasn't something to like name at that time. All I knew was like, this makes me feel d different. Um, this makes me feel seen, even though it's like completely fantastical. Yeah, cool. Keith, did you have anything? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as speculative fiction authors, you know, we get a little more scope to do, you know, 
things like that to incorporate you know more into our work um, you know the problem sometimes is the backlash against it from fandom as it were um, I noticed the other day that you know there was a big reaction because Clark Kent's son you know came out as Bob and you know there's a picture of him kissing a guy and it's like oh my god you know all these people are going nuts you know and just it's okay guys leave it alone you know <laughs> people are people and they're gonna do what they want to do and if it doesn't affect you so just move along and yeah, yeah. yeah there's plenty of other Superman content <laughs> you exactly. know I mean? if it's really that uh, sorry yeah yeah but that's that's it exactly uh -huh. so yeah but I think as spec fiction authors we do have you know, the ability to, to do that and to show things a little more yeah, yeah. all right hopeful panel here okay any mm -hmm. uh, okay I see you and then I see you so we'll go you first not just for my cancer friend um, have you found in writing either your first book or part of your series that you've cornered yourself into a world where you wish you could get out of some reality you've created and what have you done to address that <laughs> oh boy, we have another hour for this <laughs> and liquor. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to go first on that one. Go I, ahead. Um, yeah, I had a, a stupid moment where I was writing something in my sequel uh, to one of my books, and I was like, you know what I need to do? I need to go back to book one and change something there, and that'll make this line better. And then I was like, book one's already published. You can't do that. You're not George Lucas yet. You can't go back and throw in. Um, so I've had moments like that. I. You know, I, I have had that situation, and I had to do the worst thing, which is dismantle the whole book with my editor over the course of two years and, uh, and put it back together again. Wow. And it sucked. And I don't recommend it, and this is why I need to plan things out, especially when I have a multi-POV book, which I think makes things more complicated. Um, so yeah, how did I address it? By blowing it up and starting over. Mm -hmm. I wish I had a better answer than that. I wish I had a technique or a trick I could tell you, but that's, it was just the hard work. But you know what? Revising is writing. Mm -hmm. That is where the real writing comes in. My first book, it took me a year to write it. It took me three years to revise it. Yeah. Okay? So, uh, anybody else want to have a horror story? <laughs> I have skirted that by, so I, I sold my second book over the summer, um, and it's a completely different world reality. It's, a, yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with um, my debut. Uh, and I can I can see that I'm going to work like that probably for a long time. Um, I want to point out I think Le Guin's uh, Hamish cycle is a really nice way that you see you know she wrote about these nine planets and they loosely connect and some of them don't have anything to do with each other but it's like the world was made and there's nine planets and they're very far apart from each other so like left hand of darkness is a part of that and the world for the word for world is for mist is a part of that so she found I mean she was an amazing like anthropologist like um, she found a way I think to give herself that space yeah yeah I don't think I've really encountered that that much um, I mean I'm you know, working on the fourth book in my in my series right now and you know, yeah sometimes it's hard to keep track of stuff but I don't think I've really ever painted myself into a corner that I couldn't get out of so wow there are things about my first novel that I would now change but I think that's part of the vulnerability of like mm -hmm. we're making something I made that in a particular point in time and now I have to move on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that there's probably, I mean, you would probably change things, right? Oh. Like, yeah, oh, but that's I, part I, of I, it. I, it's I, like, I, this is what we, we offer, and then we have to let it go yeah. after think, you revise it a yeah. lot. I think one of the differences, too, between being a traditionally published author and a self-published author is that, you know, I see a lot of self-published authors who have gone back and you know made revisions and issued a whole new book, mm. um, you know, and basically they said, well, you know, whether they got feedback on the first one, you know, the first issue or whatever, 
and then they've gone back and revised it and just issued a new book and kind of you know gotten out of their corner that way. You know, as traditionally published authors, we don't really have that option. I don't think. Mm -hmm. You know, it's out there, and you know, nobody's going to go back and change it for you. And yeah. the best thing that you can always do is write something new. Yeah, and write something new, and and if necessary, be willing to break out the sledgehammer. <laughs> Your book is not so precious in that first stage that you can't just take a sledgehammer to it and just enjoy that process and understand at the end the book will be better and you'll be a better writer. There you go. There's Mike. Okay, I saw you were. You, I, I looked at you next, so you'll go. I've got another question that may take a hard adjustment. <laughs> Good. More in utopian versus dystopian. Utopian to me is it seems like it's the goal of the human race, which I don't think is, is appropriate. Yeah. Uh, where people have got flaws and they always will have flaws, and I'm attracted by those kinds of people, other people in Star Wars. But as far as that's concerned, the, the theme of, of that is that we're always fighting for something. All of a sudden, you know, utopia occurs. Somehow, every, all our problems are going to be solved. So I, I, I want to know your opinion on utopia versus dystopia. I mean, I would say that a lot of Star Trek, uh, or the frame of Star Trek, is utopian um, in terms mm -hmm. of we have gotten to the point where we have decided that life has enough dig dignity that you should be cared. For or without having to prove yourself um, in any sort of way. So, um, yeah. But I, I mean, you should read my book because <laughs> my book is about um, when you have everything that you could ever possibly want at attended to, um, and you don't have to die, and you don't have to have any pain do we want to hold on to certain types of pain because that is um i think a very valid human thing that's part of the pool yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, and that's part of life's precious mess yeah i i wrote uh, sorry to uh, pitch something but i wrote an article on the last episode of the good place which addresses this as well like um a, a place that's absolutely perfect actually the perfection would cause some issues. Um, did you have anything to say? To no, I, you know, I don't deal with dystopia or utopia a lot. I'm, I'm out there purely to entertain. I think mm -hmm. so. Um, but in terms of utopian fiction, I think really, you know, people will get bored with it after a while. You know, I, th mm -hmm. I think people will, they'd, they'd want to do something different, and you'd have people rebelling against the utopia. Yeah. So it, it kind of works both ways, I think. Okay. Monica Burns' new book, The Actual Meanwhile Star, deals with like a complicated utopia, yeah. which could be cool. Yeah. I'm reading it now. Oh. Uh, halfway through, very good book. Uh, I did see a hand over here, somewhere over here. Okay, and then we'll do you, and maybe one more after that, just depending on how much time, so uh, please go ahead. Sorry. See, the 10 minute sign has to oh, okay. be held up. All right, <laughs> so I think we got five, so. Yeah. How do you guys deal with like self-doubt as an author, and how do you kind of like get past that when you're like kind of just like questioning your whole like writing? Like... <laughs> I can start. I think that it is not up to me to be anyone but me and the struggles that I have and my quote unquote flaws or my quirks or my regrets, um, those all like perfectly channel to make my point of view. So I am not um, in competition with anyone. Mm -hmm. I am here to, uh, like learn the most and fall in love, I think, with my sense, with my, with my, with myself. Like that is my um, goal of life. Like to be my own greatest love story. So for me, uh, writing books and plays is the most amazing way to understand and get to know my own brain. So when you have the doubt, you bring it. And you have the guilt or the shame or the despair, you bring it. And you keep bringing it. And you keep looking. Um, 
because your your interior self is like a it's like a gold mine. It's like a dark cave. <laughs> and there's jewels, but the jewels are are not separate from those things that maybe we don't want to feel. So whenever I um, feel myself getting competitive with other people or, oh, they got that, I wanted that, um, I keep it, I like bring it back to uh, my path is not anyone's, my path is mine. Um, and I'm on a journey to get to know myself um, and to share it. And the best way that I have to share it in all my like mess and all my vulnerability is through the things that I make. Wow. Yeah, I don't think we could add anything to that. Are you and sure a lot you of want therapy. therapy. Yeah, did you? Did you <laughs> I got okay. nothing. Yeah, I can't top that. That was, that was, uh, that was, that was amazing. Actually, I'll just say real quick, um, I know Octavia Butler has a nice, uh, and I'm sure you can speak to this with more authority, uh, but, um, there is some like list of goals that she had. It's a it's beautiful and it's just things Her like journals are um, published now. Like you can see pieces of them online and they're beautiful. Yeah, and she has. I mean, one of the lines in there is just like keep, like keep working until you're good enough where they can't ignore you anymore. Something to that effect, which I think is a good attitude. And look, you have a lot of tools in your toolbox to keep going. Sometimes it is just hard work and just putting your head down. Sometimes it is optimism. Sometimes, I'll admit, sometimes it's just having a chip on your shoulder. Maybe be, I'm from Philadelphia, we've, we've mentioned it a few times, so maybe that's just a part of my DNA, I don't know. Um, but yeah, you have a few tools at your disposal to keep going, so. Um, all right, maybe, how are we doing with time? Can we do one for one more? Yeah, or? I was just gonna say, um, LDL Art the Book Festival, and uh, we do have to wrap things up. Okay, yes, it is 1228, so. So, a huge round of applause. All right, cool, thank you. So I think like this is doing it this way better. But look, stay in touch. If there's anything like, if you're in New York or if like, I don't know, you have some event going on, just just reach out to me. I'm sure there's. I mean, we have to network and collaborate and stuff like that. So. And nice to meet you.